Um, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I, I think one of the privileges or the benefits of going later in these presentations is that everybody has done a lot of the background work beforehand. So um, I think my talk is gonna follow on very much from uh, what Shaley's just talked about and what Hunter talked about just previously. So um, my, my main interest is in using microorganisms to biodegrade contaminants in the subsurface. And here is a model of the type of uh, process that we do. We're adding propane into the subsurface promoting biodegradation of various contaminants. Um, and in this one, we're particularly gonna focus on 1,4-dioxane. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the engineering side of it. I'm gonna talk more about the underlying microbiology. And again, um, a lot of this has already been covered, so hopefully I'll be able to flip through kind of quickly. Um, where's my next slide? Okay, there we go. Okay, um, the highlighted parts in red here are really the, the, the key issues that I, you need to concentrate on. 1,4-dioxane, uh, certainly in groundwater can, environments, is, is often associated with chlorinated uh, solvent co-contaminants, uh, predominantly 1,1-TCA, but as Hunter was pointing out, there's good evidence for TCE as well. Um, concentrations are typically low, uh, less than 100 parts per billion. And the cleanup goals are also low, roughly, you know, to a first approximation, one part per billion. So the long story short is that if you're trying to bioremediate 1,4-dioxane, uh, you're having to treat low concentrations in the presence of chlorinated co-contaminants. Um, Shaley uh, has uh, done a lot of work and um, summarized uh, a lot of uh, the key issues that deal with the organisms that grow on and metabolize 1,4-dioxane. So in other words, these are organisms that grow on this compound and use it as a sole source of carbon and energy or food to grow. Um, there are a growing number of organisms that can uh, that recognize to do this. Um, Shaley has made uh, enormous progress looking at one particular organism, Pseudonocardia dioxinivorans, CD1190. Um, these are some of the characteristics uh, associated with it, with a, a relatively high concentration KS value for growth on 1,4-D, so measured in the parts per million range. Um, and it doesn't grow particularly efficiently. Um, I, I, I'm not, about 10% of the, of the carbon is being converted to biomass. Um, one of the limitations, and I've highlighted these in uh, at least one of them in yellow, is that growth on 1,4-D um, is typically limited to around or slightly above 250 parts per billion 1,4-dioxane. And this is primarily because the organism has to gain energy from this process. Um, and uh, certainly, Shaley's done a great job looking at this. Uh, we have concentrated perhaps more on the um, on the co-metabolism side of it, where we have organisms that, as were pointed out, are fortuitously degrading 1,4-D, and they do not obtain a carbon and energy benefit from this process. So it is a, a fortuitous, accidental uh, process. Um, something that stands in contrast to the organisms that metabolize 1,4-D is that these organisms are, you know, uh, effectively ubiquitous, the type of organisms that can catalyze these type of reactions. There's a maintenance energy, the, you know, to keep the, the bugs functional is provided by another substrate, not by 1,4-D or, um, or, or other co-contaminants. And what I'm going to show to you, uh, hopefully, is uh, some of the data that we have that looking at the degradation of 1,4-D down to the it can range from part per million levels, but certainly we can achieve concentrations in the low part per billion, part per trillion concentrations final uh, with these bugs. And um, the key question that we're interested in, Shaley pointed out that tetrahydrofuran monooxygenase, which goes by various names, I, I call it THFMO, but it's also known as DXMO, is uh, closely associated with growth on 1,4-dioxane. We're interested particularly in the monooxygenase enzymes, which are enable uh, bugs to co-metabolize 1,4-D. Um, just to give you a quick summary of these terms, uh, microbial metabolism, um, you have a, a, a primary growth supporting substrate. 
In a lot of cases, the type of compounds we're interested in, the degradation is initiated by a monooxygenase enzyme. This generates a, a series of readily degradable intermediates, metabolites that eventually get metabolized and mineralized. And the carbon and energy that's generated from that process supports the growth of the microorganism. In co-metabolism, we're effectively superimposing a degradation reaction on top of that. So we have an organism that's grown on a primary substrate. It's, it's growing quite happily. And the lack of specificity of the monooxygenase primarily enables the organism to degrade these co-substrates. And in this case, we're concerned with 1,4-dioxane and the um, other uh, chlorinated co-contaminants. So often the metabolites that are generated are poorly degradable. And if they are mineralized, um, it's, it's, it's primarily an accidental pathway. It is not a, um, you know, a, a, an, an evolutionary designed or influenced um, pathway. A good example of this would be what happens for methane oxidizing bacteria, which are, grow quite readily on methane. They oxidize methane to methanol using methane monooxygenase. They ultimately mineralize this. And due to the lack of specificity of this key enzyme, these organisms are also able to degrade trichloroethylene. And that can be slowly degraded through to um, partially, in some case, cases, fully oxidized intermediates. So this is the type of process that we're interested in using these nonspecific enzymes, adding in particular substrates that lead to their induction, and then looking at the transformations of the chemicals that, uh, that those enzymes can achieve. The enzymes that we're primarily interested in are called soluble diion monooxygenases, abbreviated to SDIMOs. Uh, these are very common enzymes in hydrocarbon oxidizing bacteria. They're certainly not the only enzymes, but they are certainly some of the most uh, non-specific uh, catalysts out there. Um, and they are known to initiate the oxidation of a, a wide range of hydrocarbons, alkanes, alkenes, aromatics, heterocyclics. We classify them currently into six groups, although that may change soon. Um, and that's based on the substrate specificity of the enzyme and both the structure of the enzyme and its operon. Um, so the gene, you know, the genes that encode the enzyme highly nonspecific, and they derive their name from the fact that the hydroxylase component, the actual catalytic machinery of the enzyme, the key enzyme, the key active site containing part of the enzyme here, contains this non-heme diion center. So there are a couple of um, ion atoms in there which activate oxygen and uh, lead to the hydroxylation, typically, of the, of the compound that we're looking at. So uh, working with Detlef Nappi, I, Detlef uh, pointed out to you, I think earlier on, that he developed a very, very sensitive assay for 1,4-dioxane with a limited detection of around 0.15 parts per billion. So we have evaluated uh, representative organisms from most of the groups of SDIMOs. So these are model organisms that are known to express these enzymes. These are the various groups here. These are the various substrates. Uh, these are the various enzymes that get in their abbreviations. And what we have here are uh, assays that were done or previously reported or work that we have done where uh, we've looked at the co-metabolism, the degradation of 1,4-dioxane at high concentrations, and then using a standardized assay looking at concentration, uh, a starting concentration in 100 parts per billion. What we find is that there are, in fact, only two enzyme groups that can catalyze the oxidation of 1,4-D at these low environmentally relevant concentrations. This includes THFMO, but uh, also an enzyme that we're particularly interested in, which is known as short-chain alkane monooxygenase. A key point to recognize is that um, several reports indicate that enzymes uh, or organisms that express these enzymes can degrade much higher concentrations of 1,4-D, um, you know, a thousandfold higher. Um, but we do not see that activity when we are looking at these low um, environmentally relevant concentrations. So most of the talk I'm going to talk about here from here on focuses on this enzyme scan. Um, 
genomics, uh, looking at the total gene complement of a particular organism is a very, very powerful method for looking at what an organism might be capable of. It doesn't tell you that it is capable of doing something. So we have looked at the various SDIMOs. These are various organisms that we have looked at. Anything that in red we have uh, gone through and sequenced, so we know exactly what uh, enzymes and genes are present. Anything that's previous is in, in not highlighted has been previously sequenced. When we look at this, we find that a large majority of these organisms contain this enzyme SCAM. Um, quite a few of them contain propane monooxygenase, PRMO, um, and this is indicated here. And there are a few examples of organisms that contain an entirely different class of enzymes called copper-containing monooxygenases. What I want to draw your attention to is that there is a very, very close correlation between uh, the presence of SCAM and the ability to grade 1,4-D at these very low concentrations. And particularly, we notice that cells that are grown that have propane monooxygenase and grow on propane, or in some cases butane, do not degrade 1,4-D at these very low concentrations. I should point out that this connection, SCAM and PRMO, is common uh, complement in, in a lot of bacteria. Um, and this is just the group that we have looked at in this particular study. Um, what we have done to look at which enzyme is potentially responsible for 1,4-D, particularly in um, a representative strain, which is, I just go back to that previous slide, this one, uh, Rhodococcus rhodocris ATCC 21198. Um, I've highlighted that because most of the data that I talk about is, reflects this organism. Uh, armed with the genome, we have been able to look at exactly what proteins are expressed by the organism during growth on these different hydrocarbons. We are focusing here on cells grown on uh, C4 to C2 to C4 alkanes. And these are the various uh, components of uh, SCAM. These are the various components of propane monooxygenase. What we find is that none of the proteins are expressed in cells that are grown on dextrose, but all of the proteins uh, in SCAM are produced when we grow it on ethane, propane, butane, or isobutane. In contrast, we only see propane monooxygenase expressed at high levels in cells grown on propane and just a small amount uh, for cells grown on um, isobutane. We also have a technique that we've recently developed that enables us to visualize uh, by fluorescent labeling, uh, this activity-based labeling approach. Um, and this enables us to detect active monooxygenases. So it's very different than detecting a gene or a transcript. This is a catalytically active form of the enzyme. And the data that we get from this type of analysis closely matches what we see over here on the, on the proteomics. Uh, we see no protein expression in the dextrose cells. We see high levels in cells grown on ethane, butane, and isobutane, and distinctly lower levels of activity and uh, protein in cells grown on propane. That uh, differential expression of those two enzymes has impact on what these organisms can biodegrade. So um, everything in red here represents the specific activity for cells grown on isobutane. Everything in blue represents cells grown on propane. Everything in green represents cells grown on ethane. And these are, uh, include 1,4-dioxane and many of the uh, co-contaminants that we have discussed. Uh, what we find, for example, with isobutane grown cells is that they have the highest specific activity of contaminant degrading activities. And this is the sequence in which they will, that, that their effective preference. So 1,1-DCE is very, very rapidly degraded, whereas trichloroethylene is very, very slowly degraded. And there's something in a region of a 600-fold difference in the rates between these two activities. In contrast, the propane-grown cells typically have the lowest specific activity, and we've kind of summarized this on this data here. So here's the co-substrate, and this is the specific activity here. And you will see that isobutane-grown cells particularly con consistently uh, outperform propane-grown cells. One of the things that uh, Shelley mentioned and some of the tools for monitoring the activity of microorganisms, particularly in situ, is uh, this process called compound-specific isotope analysis. 
Um, this is uh, a method that looks at the isotopic enrichment that occurs as a microorganism degrades a compound. It's a very powerful technique because it doesn't require that you identify daughter products from this process. Uh, what we find is that um, cells that are grown on tetrahydrofuran and express tetrahydrofuran monooxygenase or DMXO have a, a very characteristic set of enrichments where this is an, the hydrogen enrichment, this is the carbon enrichment. Whereas in contrast, cells of our favorite bug, ATCC 21198, have uh, a fairly consistent, but um, perhaps statistically significant, certainly different from what we see with K1, um, possibly a difference between what we see with isobutane and propane grown cells. Um, Certainly the, the idea behind this is that potentially this enormous difference between uh, cells that are using THFMO to degrade 1,4-D and SCAM to degrade 1,4-D uh, give you very, very different signatures, which may enable you to tell what type of degradation process is occurring in the environment. Um, and possibly this difference here represents this difference between propane monooxygenase expression levels in, uh, compared to isobutane grown cells. Uh, one of the things we've also done, again, in conjunction, I, I think like Shaley has worked with Microbial Insights to uh, develop a qPCR assay for this. Um, and all of the organisms that I showed you earlier, um, based on the genomes, we know exactly which enzyme systems they have. Anything that we see here listed in blue, uh, which has a scam, divided by propane monooxygenase ratio of one or greater, degrades 1,4-D at 100 parts per billion in our standardized assay. So anything over here um, says if you have SCAM, it doesn't really matter whether you have PRMO or not, you will degrade 1,4-dioxane. In contrast, these are organisms that only have propane monooxygenase, and they clearly do not degrade. Uh, anything in red does not degrade 1,4-dioxane. We've also applied this to various enrichment cultures. And um, for the most part, this is a, 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 accurately predicts what we, we have seen. The one outlier in the system is this one where we have an organism that clearly has this similar ratio of one to one SCAM encoding gene and PRMO encoding gene, uh, but doesn't appear to degrade 1,4-dioxane. Um, other techniques that we can use in the field. Um, one of the things that we are particularly interested in using is extending this, uh, this labeling process um, to detect and quantify and estimate rates of 1,4-dioxane degradation or the degradation of any other contaminant. Um, this shows you uh, what it looks like if we look at all the proteins in a cell and they've been separated out and labeled. Uh, this is what the cells look like themselves. So they are highly fluorescent and work we're currently involved in involves separating these organisms from mixtures using flow cytometry or for, uh, uh, fluorescence activated cell sorting uh, to enumerate these organisms in a particular sample. So in the end, we can correlate uh, measured rates with the degree of um, fluorescence. And this data is for a model uh, compound uh, rather than one for dioxane. The thing that we find this is particularly attractive and particularly useful is that it can not only detect and quantify, but also using this approach in proteomics, we can identify what the active enzyme is in a particular sample, rather than relying on a gene or a transcript, which are several steps removed from uh, an actually catalytically active protein. The very last thing I want to talk to you about is an interesting and exciting uh, sort of development that we've been working on, uh, which is a sort of example of precision bioremediation, armed with all this information about which particular monooxygenases a microorganism has, armed with the fact that we can detect whether or not a specific monooxygenase is being expressed with our labeling technique. What we have done is develop this uh, co-encapsulation system where we have specific organisms with specific catalytic capabilities co-encapsulated in gel and gum beads. And this is an example of what the beads look like um, and co-encapsulate them with an alcohol-releasing slow-release compound 
which is effectively like putting a battery into, this, um, into these little beads. And so the cells will continue to express the monooxygenase, in this case, SCAM. And we have data here that shows that we can get continuous degradation, concurrent degradation of 1,1-TCA, cis-DCE, and 1,4-D using these beads um, out to uh, about 240 days. I think um, uh, my collaborator, Lou Semprini, has now actually got this over 300 uh, days. So uh, a potentially very useful and um, uh, application of these omics approaches to understanding microbial physiology and applying it to biodegradation processes. I think my very last slide is um, a bit of a conclusion. Um, Unlike 1,4-D metabolizing bacteria, which grow on uh, and ultimately um, suffer uh, energy limitation, uh, bacterial co-metabolism can degrade 1,4-D at an environmentally relevant concentrations, significantly lower than 100 parts per billion. Um, I would say from our work, there's a very clear distinction between um, assaying 1,4-D co-metabolism at very high concentrations, you know, in the PPM region, versus these environmentally relevant concentrations. Um, we can also have demonstrated that co-metabolic systems can concurrently degrade a lot of the 1,4-D co-contaminants. Uh, again, like Shaley, we do have a problem with 1,1-DCE. And um, certainly the field studies that we're involved in at the moment um, are really not focused anymore on getting rid of 1,4-D. 1,4-D happens to be actually pretty easy to biodegrade co-metabolically, the limitation and the problem that we face is uh, concurrent presence of 1,1-DCE. Um, certainly, the our genomics uh, studies have shown that co-expression of multiple monooxygenases with different primary substrate and co-substrate specificities is very common in alkane oxidizing bacteria, which kind of transforms our understanding and the ways that we can assay these organisms in the environment. Um, we are very uh, high on the, uh, the catalytic capabilities of SCAM, um, and we feel that certainly data that I haven't talked about here, uh, which focuses on the use of isobutane, provides us with a very, very selective mechanism for um, enriching this particular organisms that possess, possess and express this enzyme using isobutane as a primary substrate. And those last data point to um, the co-encapsulation as a, a very sustainable, precise method for degrading specific contaminants and mixtures. And again, based on the genomic understanding we have for individual organisms and knowing what those enzymes uh, can, can biodegrade and cannot biodegrade, we can mix and match and add whatever organism we want into that bead to achieve uh, degradation of particular mixtures. And then lastly, that uh, activity-based labeling technique is something that um, I, I think is gonna have a, a big impact because it enables us to detect catalytically active enzymes rather than doing things by proxy, which is looking at genes, which then have to be expressed, et cetera. Um, so hopefully looking to the future, uh, that those will become useful tools. And in closing, uh, I just need to acknowledge the various folks that have been involved in it. Uh, Amy McElroy is a graduate student who did a lot of the biodegradation work in conjunction with Detlef. Um, our partners in some of the field studies were involved in at Aptum and Haley and Aldrich. Lou Semprini's group at Oregon State University has been, uh, did a lot of the chlorinated solvent degradation work for us at, in conjunction collaboration. And Dora Taggart at Microbial Insights, uh, providing the, the qPCR uh, expertise. And, this work has all been funded by CERDA and uh, a couple of ESTCP projects. And I think with that, I will call it quits. Thanks. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, today uh, on this panel. Several people I've worked with, which is always fun, um, are also talking. Um, I have uh, worked on one for dioxane for many years, uh, a lot of applied research projects, uh, a lot of them focusing on sort of these empirical data studies um, where we found quite a bit of pretty positive news about 1,4-dioxane relative to things like plume size um, and, and the um, uh, evidence for attenuation at these, at these contaminated groundwater sites. Uh, today, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on one of the challenges that we see moving ahead of us at these sites. 
so really uh, what's sort of motivating us here is sort of thinking about some of these things that, that previous uh, speakers have talked about. Uh, and one is this combination that you've got this widely occurring compound, but when you see it in the environment, uh, it's usually at pretty low dilute concentrations. And so we'll show some of that data uh, here in a second. But what this means is that really the methods that you go about trying to um, uh, identify this compound become extra critical uh, at those low levels. So the basic objective of, the, of this study is essentially just you know, understand how well we're doing uh, at getting the data that we need to sort of understand uh, and identify uh, these particular sites. Uh, so this is maybe the third talk that's had this figure uh, from one of our earlier papers. But again, this is the UCMR3 data. And, and I show this primarily so that I can make sure that um, I acknowledge the person who created it, which is uh, Jimena Osorio in our, in our shop. Um, but again, what this is showing is, is this fact that within drinking water, uh, we see a pretty wide occurrence of 1,4-dioxane up to the point that 21.9% uh, of all of these public water systems that were part of this EPA mandated program uh, saw 1,4-dioxane in at least one of those samples that they were collecting. The thing to remember though is that they were using, uh, they had to use this EPA method 522. Um, so this is a, a solid phase extraction based method. Um, it can get you down to really low uh, levels. So the reporting limit on these was 0.07 micrograms per liter. Uh, this is a really great method, uh, but it's really only applicable for drinking water. If you've got environmental samples, so samples at, at these contaminated sites, uh, it's not going to be something that you're going to have to use. So you're forced to sort of rely on, on the available methods um, that may have some limitations associated with them, uh, as we'll go forward with uh, here later in the talk. Um, but again, that's occurrence. And then thinking about sort of the concentrations that we're sort of targeting. And these are data, again, some of which uh, Hunter had showed already, uh, uh, these box plots showing sort of the median uh, uh, of the maximum concentration that was observed at several different kinds of sites. So um, for example, you've got the Air Force plants uh, there, uh, you've got other installations, and then we, on the darker box, have overlaid uh, the data distribution from sort of a set of commercial industrial uh, with some DOD sites in there. And what you're seeing is sort of, you know, these low parts per billion to maybe uh, 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 10 part per billion to maybe 100 parts per billion or what you might be expecting to see. And it's really particular concern at the DOD sites. Those ones on the left seem to have a slightly lower concentration. So that makes our job hard. It, it makes it really difficult to identify and characterize these sites and highlights that importance uh, of method selection. Uh, another way to think about this then is to sort of look at the way that um, uh, these data help us identify sites is to look at the chlorinated solvents that are, that are also there as well. And we've talked about this in, in previous talks as well. Um, but they established that you know, most of the 1,4-dioxane sites are also chlorinated solvent sites. Uh, we actually see 93% you know, of the 1,4-dioxane sites have, have TCE. Uh, it's a little smaller for 1,1,1 TCA, but that's because it degrades. Uh, but if you use these data to sort of look at the extent of which we're even sort of failing to identify 1,4-dioxane sites. So a lot of information on this slide, but, but focus on the left box for now. Um, these are TC, sites where TCE was analyzed. That big bubble shows it was detected at um, uh, 2,865 sites. 1,4-dioxane uh, was detected at 273 of these TCA uh, these, these sites, but not at, at 218. Uh, but there's that other bubble um, that's next to it that's essentially saying that uh, at, at TCE sites, there was 2,374, a really large amount um, where no 1,4-dioxane analysis was conducted at all. So based on thinking about co-occurrence, these bubbles there for, for TCE and, and TCA and 1,1-DCE, you'd sort of expect those to be uh, sites where you see a high probability for finding 1,4-dioxane if you actually went and looked for it. And again, we haven't spent a lot of time looking for this compound yet. Uh, we're starting to, and we need to make sure that we're using those the right methods. So our current options are sort of twofold on the environmental side. Um, one is sort of thinking about um, the 82, EPA 8260 methods. So these are designed for volatile compounds. Um, 
So these have some advantages for 1,4-dioxane in that you're collecting these, these BOA vials, these 40 mil vials, so you don't have to collect a lot of water. Uh, and you may be able to get chlorinated compounds within the same particular run in that. But these have a really big problem, as we'll see looking at some of the data in terms of the reporting limits associated with them. They're pretty high and not necessarily going to give you the information that you need. You also have the potential for interferences um, from, from the CDOCs themselves. So when you're running in full scan mode, uh, you might not be able to see 1,4-dioxane either. The other main alternative then becomes the 8270 methods. And so these are the so-called semi-volatile methods where you know, you're, you're using an extraction on these uh, in order to sort of do a better job at seeing 1,4-dioxane where you're not necessarily just relying on its volatility. You know, 1,4-dioxane, not all that volatile once it's mixed into water. Uh, so this provides you some advantages uh, in terms of getting lower to port reporting limit, uh, maybe in the, in the low or below one PPB range. Uh, the problem with these data is they can, they tend to be bias low. Uh, extraction efficiencies for 1,4-dioxane are not all that good. Um, so we do have reports of that these data might be giving you a lower than the actual uh, value. Uh, the volume requirements are high. These are one liter uh, amber bottles that you're collecting generally. So if you had a, a, a situation where you have a low groundwater yield, that could be a problem. And then again, anytime you're adding additional bottles uh, time, you're adding potential extra costs uh, to your overall. Uh, analytical program. Other options that are available then with, uh, with those existing methods is the so-called SIM methods. So these are selective ion monitoring. You can do this with both uh, 8260 and 8270. So essentially you're scanning across a narrower range. So that allows you to, to sort of hone in on that area where you might expect to see 1,4-D and get, get better uh, resolution on that. So it improves your sensitivity and, and reduces that potential for interference. Uh, the cons are obviously, this is an additional analysis. So a separate analysis, uh, adding additional costs as well. But these are becoming uh, more popular as we'll see. Uh, the other option then is thinking about isotope dilution. Uh, and so Detlef touched on this in terms of the, met the methods that they're developing in their lab. And this can be pretty powerful. So essentially what you're doing here is you're taking the existing 8260 and 8270 methods uh, and you're using that uh, in, and using an isotope uh, adding that as an internal standard uh, to your environmental sample. Uh, you're measuring the 1,4-D concentration, uh, measuring the recovery of the isotopic standard, uh, and then using that to correct for your biases that might be associated with that poor recovery uh, of the target analyte. Again, this is, is good in terms of making sure that you have accuracy and sensitivity, uh, but it comes at a potential extra cost. So what we're doing as part of this study is essentially taking a whole bunch of data. Uh, in this case, we're talking about over 100,000 data points uh, that were collected uh, within a relatively long time period. So we're talking about 19 years between uh, 2001 and 2019, uh, and basically focusing on what the data tell us. What do they tell us in terms of sort of sensitivity, a detection frequency over time? In this case, we're focusing on things like uh, the 8260 method, 8270 method, uh, the adoption of the SIM methods, uh, and see how that, that has helped us. Uh, so this first graph is sort of similar uh, than, you know, Hunter had shown uh, some of these sorts of data for, for the uh, DOD installations. Uh, but what we're showing here then is these colored bars uh, going from 2001 to 2019 representing the individual methods. So the bluer ones are the 8260, the, the volatile base methods. Uh, the greener ones are the semi-volatile 8270 methods uh, with slightly different colors associated with the, the SIM methods. And you do see a good shift from these sort of less um, uh, sensitive uh, 8260 methods uh, into the 8270 methods as you go through time, you know, bigger on those, on those green sides. And then the orange dots show the median reporting limit associated with all analyses, with the thousands and thousands of analyses uh, that were uh, completed within a particular year. And you see that clearly that shift in those methods is corresponding to uh, lower reporting limits over time. Although it is pretty clear uh, based on what you're seeing in those later years that we've sort of stalled out in that um, sort of right above one uh, microgram per liter uh, range in terms of our sort of uh, what, we, what we generally get uh, with, these, with these methods. 
Uh, so this is, again, looking at that in terms of what it means in detraction frequency. And again, the reporting limit, those are the solid uh, circles, decreases over time. And as Hunter showed in his graph as well, that's leading to an de increased detection frequency, the, the sort of dotted line with the, with the open circles. We've gotten to the point now with when, when we're going to look for one for dioxane, at least among the universe of sites where we're, we're sort of um, looking for it, uh, we see it about 50% of the time. Um, so in about half the samples. Um, so, so it's really led to a shift in our ability to see it, even though we don't think the nature of these sites in any way uh, has actually changed. It's not like we're necessarily releasing a lot more 1,4-dioxane, um, but we're just improving our ability to see it. And again, it's pretty obvious, as, as, as Hunter mentioned before, that you should expect to see this correlation. And so this is essentially just showing for each one of these dots representing a particular year, what the median detection frequency, that's what's on the um, uh, x-axis versus the, the median reporting limit associated with that year, that's what's on the y-axis. And in this particular case, all of the early years are up here in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, and all of the later years are in the lower right-hand corner. So we're seeing the expected trend that, that, that we would expect to see. Looking at the individual methods then, you know, what do we get? Well, 8260, this is sort of the, the method that people would like to use because it, <laughs> it is cheaper and you're getting your CBOC data, but it's not really getting high data quality. So these, these solid bars are, or sorry, solid circles are showing the reporting limit and it's not great. We're sort of seeing in the 40 to 100 microgram per liter. Uh, so we're not doing a good job when we use this uh, of, of seeing one for dioxin, and that's reflected in that low detection frequency, uh, sort of the, you know, the zero to 10 range. 8260 SIM uh, does a little bit better. The reporting limit generally is down around uh, two micrograms per liter for that, and that again increases our detection frequency uh, as we would expect to see. Uh, 8270, uh, we uh, al almost had no uh, actual usage of that up until about 2000. Five, so we see some jumping around in those early years in terms of the detection frequency. But the reporting limit is sort of around that one microgram per liter of, of what uh, we're getting uh, mostly uh, in these later years. And again, it's uh, a relatively high detection frequency, but remember that these may be bias low. We don't know in this case how many of these were using isotopic dilution. So, so there is a chance that these data are sort of up, up underrepresenting uh, the actual concentration. Uh, finally, the 8270 SIM, which should be our best method uh, in terms of our sensitivity, uh, we do see some dipping of this reporting limit down below uh, one microgram per liter, but it does actually sort of jump up again in these later years. And so uh, this will become important uh, later as we sort of talk about the levels that, that we sort of need to get. Uh, again, this does represent the lowest reporting limits of any of these methods that are that were sort of evaluated, uh, and as a result, result uh, caused the highest detection frequencies, sort of above 60% uh, on an annual basis. Uh, when this becomes important, then, is to go back and think about site identification. And so, walking through these next couple slides is sort of thinking about the total universe of sites where. 1,4-dioxane uh, was analyzed. And so 822 is our sort of starting number uh, where we have some data available to, to us. Uh, and we see that you know, roughly half, a little less than half of these sites, uh, we saw 1,4-dioxane, 341. At those sites, that, green, that greenish uh, bubble, uh, we had a reporting limit of one microgram per liter. Uh, and the median detection at those sites was sort of 10 micrograms per liter, so, so really low. The sites where they weren't detecting it, uh, that 59%, that blue bubble, uh, that was actually a, a, a universe of sites where essentially the median reporting limit was 57 micrograms per liter. So that's a big deal when you compare to that green bubble where what they were trying to see was something around 10 micrograms per liter. So what they were actually doing was choosing methods that essentially weren't working for them. That becomes a little bit clearer when you actually look at the methods that they were using. So on those sites where they saw it on the green side, uh, most of those sites were using the 8270, uh, 8270 SIM methods, the more sensitive of the available methods. While the uh, ones where they weren't seeing it, they were almost primarily using uh, 
non-8270 uh, SIN methods. So they were essentially screening out these sites or a large portion of these sites, possibly because they were not using a method that was designed to actually see the concentrations that, that they may have been looking for. Uh, this becomes an issue when you're thinking about, well, a lot of these sites, these blue ones may not have had 1,4-dioxane at all, but certainly some of them would have. And, and one way to look for an indicator of that is to again, go back to the co-occurrence data. There's a lot of these sites that have chlorinated solvents. Um, so there are potential uh, decent amount of false negative sites uh, within that, that, that particular uh, set of sites. And again, this becomes really important as we move forward with, with uh, increased regulatory scrutiny on this compound. And a lot of the early speakers touched on this, but we're starting to see levels being established by the states. And for example, Colorado has is, is already established a 0.35 microgram per liter, and this is a groundwater number. So this is something where you're taking an environmental sample. Um, the median MDL that we saw, this is method detection limit, not the reporting limit. Uh, for 8270, um, when we're just focusing in on these later few years, uh, was 0.28, which you know sounds sort of okay, but the actual reporting limit, after accounting for you know dilutions or or other um, matrix interferences, was actually in the one microgram per liter. Uh, so what we're seeing is that typically most of these analyses are not actually reaching the required sensitivity to sort of measure compliance against the standard, something like the Colorado uh, groundwater level. So, you know, at most, we're talking about 22% of, of 8270 SIM methods actually being able to be good enough um, to reach those methods. So what this sort of highlights is that we're getting better. We've got these trends in, in terms of our, our shift to more sensitive methods uh, that are helping us essentially see uh, the dilute concentrations that we need to see in order to maybe identify sites. We're not necessarily seeing everybody adopt them uh, universally, but we are seeing improvement in that area. And, and part of this is probably related to uh, the, the continued adoption of isotope uh, dilution and other SIM methods. Um, and, and actually states, specific states are beginning uh, to mandate that you use methods. I, I believe that New York still has the requirement that if you're going to go out and look for 1,4-doxane at a contaminated site, uh, you need to use the 8270 methods. But again, what that previous slide highlights is that we're not really where we need to be. Uh, we're potentially missing some sites uh, and the sensitivity that we're getting even with our best available commercial methods is often above those regulatory levels. I do believe we're gonna see improvement. Uh, you know, uh, Detlef highlighted that his lab using her heated purge and trap methods, uh, they're able to routinely get down to 0.15. Um, labs, if you tell them you need to get lower, oftentimes can get lower. So we need to make sure that uh, routinely that we can, we can do that. Uh, and that comes from people making sure they understand, develop, uh, and communicate uh, what those data quality objectives are uh, so that they can ensure that they're getting the data that they need in order to sort of, to sort of meet those objectives. Uh, so that's all I had. Um, uh, so current status of 1.4 dioxane moderate molecular mechanisms of action We've heard quite a bit in terms of environmental detection and also bio uh, remediation and uh, microbial metabolism and so on. So we're moving a little bit to experimental sets from animals and maybe uh, I think we are um, perhaps the only active lab right now in the United States, if I'm not mistaken, that we're doing, we're continuing those, those studies on on mouse models. So again, this, my department is heavily involved on that. And as I told you, we're very close partners with, a term, uh, with um, chemical and environmental engineering, Jai Hongs and uh, department and many, John and Jordan and Drew. We have a, I, mean, I thought was, that was a very good review and I'm planning to have another one with all of you on this case, but we, we put together I, what I thought was a very good review for 1.4 dioxane going from metabolism toxicity to um, remediation and also reverse health outcomes. Um, most of my slides have been already talked for 1.4 dioxane toxicity. As Linda started with her first talk, uh, 
primarily is liver and kidney affected. And of course you have nasal and colouring effects on uh, when you have uh, inhalations, uh, exposures. For liver toxicity, it's a dose dependent, and you have the generation of hepatic uh, stels and development preneoplastic lesions, central lobular swelling and necrosis, increased DNA synthesis, chromosomal damage, and enzyme linkage. Uh, kidney toxicity is evidenced by degeneration of cortical tubule cells, tubular necrosis, and glomerular nephritis. So this is just a summary of what studies have been done in terms of um, um, liver toxicity and essentially carcinogenicity, but also cytotoxicity. The reason that I'm giving you that is because there was the notion, well, they cause toxicity, but this is due, they cause carcin is a hepatocarcinogen, but this is because there is some toxicity. However, if you go throughout here, you can see not of this, is evident all the time. So I don't think the case, and we, most of us, we don't believe that carcinogenicity is due to the toxicity of this compound. So uh, carcinogenicity, uh, it's been mentioned sincerely that uh, Mary mentioned that, that um, 1.4 dioxane can induce cancer in several animal species. It's a dose-dependent liver carcinogenicity with enhanced effect in female mice compared to males in the long-term experiments. So this is something that we really need to pay a good attention to it. Uh, however, the mechanism by which 1.4 dioxane causes cancer is certainly unclear. And we mentioned that there was there is no really studies indicating that this is a genotoxic effect. Um, on the other side, on the other hand, uh, dioxane appears to be a tumor promoter rather than initiator by uh, promoting carcinogenic potential of diethylnitrosamine in rats. But there was this fascinating, I thought this was a fascinating study by Furiata et al. in 2018. And what these guys did is they exposed rats into uh, 440, if I remember, milligram per kilogram of dioxin for 24 days. And then they did um, sequencing on the RNA and they pick up specific biomarkers and you know they treat the animals with non-genotoxic, with genotoxic hepatocarcinogens, non-genotoxic hepatocarcinogens and non-genotoxic non-hepatocarcinogens. So you can see the, um, the PCA analysis puts dioxin completely different from the genotoxic and non-genotoxic. And when they did this analysis, they combined even larger data sets. You can see again, dioxin discriminates completely from these two groups. And you can see here also that there is this, then, um, this, this discrimination. So whatever it is, the mode of action is completely different from the classic cases of hepatotoxic and non-hepatotoxic. So is it a combination of both? We don't know, but this is what we're trying to find out. So um, I'm going to start with the metabolism, and I'm going to tell you what we have done. We have one paper ready to be submitted um, with, um, uh, in collaboration with um, uh, my lab and uh, Caroline Johnson's laboratory in my department. So, um, but essentially, here is what I have come up with the one dioxin metabolism, and we're working on a comparative metabolism with bacteria, which I'm gonna communicate with you all, right? We can do a comparative metabolism um, study a review on that. But in general, dioxin has, this is the main route of, of um, oxidation. And you also have the cytochrome P450s. It is most likely 2E1, but may could be other enzymes involved in here, but this is not really, um, well defined yet. So then you have other enzymes involved mainly, and we, you guys mentioned that the alcohol dehydrogenase, and also you have aldehydes um, generated as middle products before you have the hydroxyethoxy acetic acid, which is the fan that we measure in biological samples in order to determine the exposures of that. So you have the aldehyde dehydrogenase in here. 
and especially ALDH2, which is uh, a mitochondrial enzyme, which is very important because you know that we have this genetic polymorphism, which makes this enzyme completely uh, ineffective in um, Asian population, about almost 50% of the population. So uh, we, as I said, we have done the first study with uh, three different doses for one and four weeks. We didn't really see any toxicity, <clears throat> but we did see some, we did, the approaches we took was proteomics, metabolomics, um, and uh, also the RNA seq. So the data, which I'm not going to show you because I'm trying to, 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 to um, gain some time here, is what we found is we found some the RNA seq data. They show some differences in the glutathione related genes, and also in the DNA um, damage genes. And we did find actually with the histologic data that the H2AX was upregulated in the high doses, which indicates there is something on the DNA damage. And again, it could be, um, and we're still trying to analyze this data further. So Yin Chen from our department, just pick up on that. And you know she's using this mice that we have available on the glutathione deficient mice, which essentially is the mice that they are um, uh, deficient in um, uh, GCLM gene. So this is um, this is the glutamate uh, cysteine ligase is the rate limiting enzyme in the synthesis of glutathione. <clears throat> and this enzyme is a hollow enzyme of the catalytic subunit, the GCLC and the GCLM. So the GCLM mice, they have about 20 to 40% less glutathione in their livers compared to the other, to the other um, compared to the wild type. So in this particular case, they have lower glutathione. So <clears throat> you might have a oxidative stress and oxidative stress response in this animal. So given the fact that we have seen changes in the glutathione related uh, genes, she said, let's try this on, on this knockout mice that they have lower levels of glutathione to see if we can get um, um, some meaningful data regarding the, um, the mode of action of this, uh, of this chemical. So um, what she, I'm sorry, what she has done is it has a high acute exposure, which is oral gavage one gram per kilogram per day for seven days, which corresponds to 5,000 parts per million in drinking water. And again, we started with a low, with a higher doses. And as I will explain you, we have lower doses. And she also did the high exposure, which is three months of the same dose, 5,000 uh, PPM in drinking water. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this. Uh, this is not the RNA seq. This is QP, uh, the R uh, quantitative RT-PCR. And she measured the antioxidant response, the NERF2 genes. You can see the GCLM, GCLC, glutathione peroxidase, redox, uh, well, reductase, and also hemoxygenase. We also uh, she looked at the xenobiotic metabolism, the NK1, GSTM1, UGTA1, and MRP3. And finally, um, also for xenobiotic metabolism, non, um, no. Uh, NRF2 targeted genes. So uh, one, the point that I want to make here is you can see that this mice, the knockout is with red, the um, wild type is with dark, with black, but you can see here there is a trend, there is an increase of GCLC, whatever it is, the mouse is trying to make more glutathione to bypass probably the effects of this, um, of this chemical. So we do see a reductase, um, the glutathione uh, reductase increasing here, but essentially they're going somehow going back. The same thing with hemoxygenase. One of the things that it was very intriguing, nobody has reported at all, and nobody has reported actually those uh, results in terms of RNA seq. Only uh, thing that we knew was some increase of 2E1 in terms of enzymatic activity. So what we show here, and it's impressive, I'm not gonna take you through all this, 
the NQ1 gets upregulated in both well type and also knockouts, and it stays there after three months. Whereas the GSTM1 gets upregulated, but essentially goes back down. So you can see the NERF2 genes, they all go down with the exception of the NQ1. And um, the same thing, you know, ALDH1 is here, uh, CYP1A2 and uh, 1A1, which may indicate this is might be for AH receptor uh, targeted pathway, which is not the case, but the 2E1, we do see an increase again of, uh, of the transcript, which goes back down again. And uh, she's done a lot of um, other uh, genes, the inflammation related genes, not really any big difference in here. And also the carcinogenesis related gene where we see the BRCA1 that goes up regulated, especially in the knockout mice. And then it stays up, which again, DNA repair and DNA damage is most likely what we're gonna be, what we're looking for as a mechanism. So, this is actually a fantastic Western blot and protein expression that you can see here. And I can take you through very quick on that because we still have more talks coming. We have two more talks coming up, but you can see this is the well type animals, three animals per case, um, well type and knockout mice. This is again, GCLM knockout mice. They have 20% of total glutathione compared to the well types. So you can see the GCLM gene is completely gone. And as I told you, the GCLC, you can, this is in a, in a complete agreement with the RNA seq The GCLC gene tries to get upregulated so she can, it can synthesize more glutathione to bypass this uh, exposure to, um, to 1.4 dioxane. The 2E1 gets upregulated uh, at the protein level after the treatment with dioxane. And again, this is three months treatment and you can see it's obvious here in the knockouts, it's a little bit elevated here in the knockouts, but it's further elevated. And all the statistical analysis have been done if you can see in all this in here. And I, I should tell you the p-value here, the T stands for treatment, the G stands for the genotype. She's done a, a fantastic um, biostatistical analysis in all this data. So the other point I wanna show you one more time is the NK1 gets upregulated. It's a little bit upregulated to the uh, untreated knockout mice, but look at the effects of dioxane treatment and the NK1 stays really up. Now, remember all the NERF2 genes go back down almost, but NK1 stays up and the 2E1 stays up. The GST pi, which is also a pre-neoplastic measure uh, marker, I would say, uh, there is no really that big of a difference. The catalase and other antioxidant enzyme, there is no differences. The H2 ducts, there are some difference in here and she is still measuring the histone two and histone three and the BRCA1, we have the difference and also the P10, which are the um, catenin, um, the catenin actually is, it goes down. So we're still analyzing all this data, but again, what I wanna draw your attention to is this NQ1. And she's done also, and I'll come back to that because NQ1 is a very interesting enzyme. I actually, I, I was lucky to clone, I was the first to clone the NQ, mouse NQ1 cDNA when I was in Dan Ebert's lab. Uh, and before Ying Chen has joined University of Cincinnati a long time ago. Anyway, uh, look at this beautiful immunohistochemistry that you can see again, the four, um, four three months of, of exposure. This is the 2E1 in, in well type controns and, and well type dioxane. You can see that although it is there, but it is really enhanced in, after the exposure of the, of the, so whatever we've seen, you know, in the Western blot, we can also visualized by immunohistochemical analysis. The other thing, which again, nobody has reported on that is the, um, the increase of 4-hydroxynoninal adducts. This is antibodies against the proteins that have been adapted to 4-hydroxynoninal. 4-hydroxynoninal is one of the most reactive aldehydes produced. 
during the lipid peroxidation. And um, you can see here the strong effects, the 4-HE increased on this uh, well type and also in the knockouts in here, uh, especially in the knockout in the well type, you can see a really strong staining. Uh, also, this is still under the analysis in here. And this is the 2U1, this is the NQ1, the confirmation of what we have seen. And you know the 4-HE also in here. So there is a strong uh, association between the expression of the NQ1, the 2E1, and the 4 hne At the same time, um, she has measured the liver GSH and GSSG levels on um, on on this uh, on this mice, and again control dioxin seven days, dioxin uh, three three months in here. And what you can see is although there is a transit increase of uh, glutathione in uh, in, in um, dioxin treated well type animals, this goes back again. So whatever you see earlier, it's a first response to dioxin, which essentially on the three month, it still goes down. So you have an initial response that goes down and total the total levels of glutathione for the three months essentially is really, um, uh, it's, it, there is a trend here, it goes, it goes down. So um, what do we have in progress for that? We have actually, as we speak, um, they are all day, all data sets are, uh, all the uh, animals have been uh, sequenced by RNA seq analysis. We already have some metabolomic analysis, George Tsarkov Taki from my lab analysis on liver and plasma of these mice and continue to follow that up. But at the same time, uh, Yin has set up uh, Yin uh, with the help of another graduate student from our lab, Yahweh uh, Wang. They have started a six month follow up study with in this knockout and well type mice with lower dioxane doses. And that includes of five and uh, 50 and uh, 500 parts per, uh, per million. And these studies will go for six months. At the same time, I have started an collaboration uh, with um, Nicholas Katsanis to initiate some hepatocarcinogen, uh, hepatocarcinogenetic studies in zebrafish and especially using some transgenic zebrafish with the KRAS that we can uh, really get further information. So what are, this is what, what is going on and what, um, what we're going to do and what we're proposing to do in the future is and this is based on what we have seen. I'm gonna bring you back again, the metabolism here, and also the fact that the 2E1 is upregulated by the exposure of, of 1.4 dioxin. As you know, uh, 2E1 metabolizes the TCE, and there is a very recent study that TCE is not carcinogenic in, in 2E1 knockout mice, which indicates that if you have the co-exposure of TCE of the other carcinogens that they are metabolized um, by 2E1. So if you have the, the, um, the 1.4 dioxin, which induces the 2E1 and you show to the what extent, then it can serve as a um, promoter or you know working together in terms of uh, genetic effects with this mixture. So we're proposing to do studies, first of all, to characterize the adverse outcome pathways and characterizing path, uh, biomarkers of 1.4 dioxin carcinogenesis. And we're proposing to use five different knockouts. First of all is the 2E1, which is three in here, but essentially we wanna see if we block the P450 metabolism by the 2E1 and the involvement of the 2E1 on the metabolism of the 1.4 dioxin. We're gonna address the question is the dioxin percent which is contributes to that or is something related to the metabolism. Second question is what's going on with NQ1? NQ1 is not in here. There is no involved in the metabolism in here. However, NQ1 in addition, there are several modes of, of um, gene expression regulation in this gene. One is the NERF2 pathway, the other is the AH receptor pathway. And there is a third one, which we don't know by which 
years. It could be a different, completely different mode of action. Mode of action. And this is related to, um, um, to, 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 to uh, NQ1 being a biomarker of preneoplastic lesions. So it has been reported since 1978 that two, uh, NQ1, I'm sorry, the quinone oxidoreductase is a biomarker of preneoplastic lesions. And it's really a prognostic marker for liver carcinogenesis. So when I use this knockout mice to address, do we see if we have this, if we block this, does it play a role in the process of carcinogenesis? Of course, to address if it's this and also a combination of that we propose to use and we have the nerve to knockout mice in our lab. So all these genes, all these knockouts are available in our lab with the exception of the NQ1, which at meeting the other night with David Ross, and we're gonna request that uh, knockout model from NIH to include for these studies. And again, it's the role of its own metabolism here that we're gonna do in great details, but also the second specific aim, we're gonna do the co-exposures. The co in other words, these knockout mice will be exposed to a combination of uh, dioxin along with uh, TCE and TCA and DCA. So uh, with that, I forgot to put a, a thank you, uh, a thank you um, slide. Um, I'm gonna stop and